So if you remember, we're in the book of John, and we're working through John chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So you may say, well, wait a minute, we're in the book of John. You just said, turn to 1 Kings. I did. But as you know, we use scripture to interpret scripture. We use scripture to highlight scripture. So of course, one story will always throw us to look at another story. Uh, and then it actually just causes the whole thing to come together. And most of all, we realize, wow, God is really the same. And because he doesn't change, I can study all the stories and see the similar pattern of how he works in their lives. And then because he's no respecter of persons, it means he has no favorites. Say that. God has no favorites. We live in a world that has favorites, right? Uh, you don't have to live long before your little kid, little kids come home. You have to explain to them, uh, unfortunately, that's called favoritism and it stinks, right? But God has no favorites. So as we study all of Scripture, see the stories of how he works in all of the people's lives in Scripture, we can then be so encouraged because we know that he's doing the same thing in our life. Say it one more time. God has no favorites. God has no favorites. So... We were in John, and remember, it's the darkest night of human history. The darkest night of human history, it is the night where Judas is run out at this point to go and betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Some said that's the equivalent of $67. That's, that's how much it took for him to betray uh, who he would call his Lord and his best friend, right? Judas has run out into the night to betray him. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's preparing them for him going to the cross where he's going to die for all of their sins and all of our sins, right? He's done told them, you guys are going to all run when I am taken in custody. Peter says, they might run, but I'm not going to run. He says, well, you're actually going to fall even worse. You're going to deny even knowing me, and you're going to deny me three times, right? Then he says, I'm going somewhere where you can't come with me. And after being with the disciples for three and a half years, it's the first time he's, he's mentioned leaving them. So this is the darkest night of human history. It's only going to be some hours from now where Jesus will be sweating great drops of blood and where Judas will come in and betray him with that kiss on the cheek and the Lord will be taken and will be run through a bogus, wicked trial and then be nailed to the cross uh, the next day. So this is the darkest night of human history. And what does Jesus say after giving them all of this news, Right? He's just told Judas, what you're going to do, go do quickly. He's just said, I must leave you and where I'm going, you can't go with me now, but you can go with me after. And he's just said, all of you are going to be offended and stumble. And he just told the most outspoken, courageous one in the group, Peter, that you're going to deny me three times. He, it sounds like he's basically saying, right, the house, it's a house of cards and the cards are about to all collapse. But then Jesus says this in John 14, but let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me the same exact way you believe in God the Father. Trust in me. Place the same trust in me as you place your trust in the invisible God whom the universe can't even contain. You see that? Here he's standing is what appears to be a mere man in front of them, but he's really the God man, and he is commanding them to put the same trust in him as they put in the invisible, eternal God whom the universe can't even contain. That's amazing to think about. And then it calls us to really say, wow, trust. Okay, I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior, meaning because I've asked him to forgive me my sins, because I've invited him into my heart, I have been saved from judgment day, and he is going to keep me from the hell fire that I deserve. He is going to keep me from the punishment that I deserve. I trust that he has paid that price. That is what, that's what it means to trust in him as your Lord and Savior, to trust in him for salvation. But while we definitely trust him to keep us from the punishment we deserve, we now know that that will never happen because we've accepted that he paid the price for us. We trust also that when we breathe our last breath, 
We will close our eyes on this side of eternity and open our eyes in paradise, right? He also says that in John 14. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I am going to prepare a place for you. And as I go prepare it, afterwards I will come and receive you, that you will be where I am. So we have the moment where we each invite Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior. Trust that what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago is enough to give us forgiveness and to make us sons and daughters of God. On the other end, it's trusting that when we breathe our last breath here, we will be in paradise where the Bible says the human eye has never seen, the human ear has never heard, the human heart can't even imagine or daydream how beautiful a place God has prepared for them that love him. But now, in between that, this Christian journey, oh, we've got to trust him with so much. We have to trust him with so much, and the more we fight the good fight of faith to trust him with so much, the more we realize how major are our trust issues. So isn't that the battle? Learning to trust God day to day while we need so much healing of so many trust issues from all of the wounds and all of the scar tissue we have from growing up in a fallen world, right? So what do we have and what do we do? There's one thing we have to do. We have to understand God's ways. It says in Hebrews chapter 3 that the Israelites in the wilderness, the reason that when it got hard, when God brought the Israelites across the Red Sea and into the wilderness, the Israelites, what did they do? They rebelled. They even started saying stuff like, man, it was better when we were slaves in Egypt, getting whipped all day and night. Then some of them actually tried to lead a campaign to go back to Egypt, right? Go back, right? But it tells us in Hebrews 3, where where did their mistake? What happened in their mistake? They weren't understanding how God's ways, God is developing us. And the trials that come in our life are not to destroy us. The hardship that comes in our life, all of the turbulence that comes in our life, it's not to destroy us. It's not time to start looking back to Egypt. It's time for us to understand that God has us in the school of faith. He's teaching us to trust him, and he's healing us of our trust issues. But we have to understand his ways. That's why Hebrews 3 says, the Israelites understood his acts, meaning they understood, oh yeah, a Red Sea got split. Oh yeah, plagues happened in Egypt. Oh yeah, just isolated acts, but it said Moses understood his ways. You realize we could fall in the same trap where we know the acts. We can recite the Bible stories. Oh yeah, God made the sun stand still. Oh yeah, God made the walls of Jericho fall. Oh yeah, God uh, toppled Goliath with a slingshot with a little, little young guy named David. We can know the acts. Oh yeah, Joseph got betrayed by his brothers and then he ended up being the prince of Egypt. We can know all the acts, but fail in knowing God's ways. God's ways, and guess what? His ways are the same and the way he works in our lives. What is God doing in your life right now? How is he teaching you to trust him? What trust issues are you discovering? And are you excited about the fact that God is going to heal you of those trust issues by replacing the wound with truth, right? By replacing the areas that feel dark and scary with the light of his promises. That is what we're going to look at today. When you look at everyone in scripture, when you take, and that's what I love about being a part of a ministry where we teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, because it's, it's the details, it's what's in the verses, it's all of, it's every word. And what happens when you see every word of God is profitable, the Bible opens up and hence an understanding of God's ways opens up in a way that is just Goodness, right? You understand why Job said, I consider this more important than my everyday food. When you look at the details, you see that every person in the Bible that we look up to, every person in the Bible that we look up to had to be taught how to believe, had to be taught how to trust. And then I love that the Holy Spirit made sure that when they wrote scripture, they would tell you that this happened in my life because God was teaching me to trust him. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse nine. 
Look at the Apostle Paul. You're looking at someone who, when he would just pass his apron out, there would be healing, right? Someone, look at how mightily God used this man. And sometimes you can just look at these people, and if you lose sight of the details of how God developed the person, how the person had the same fears as you, had the same issues as you, what do you do? You end up just putting them on a pedestal and saying, Paul's up here, and Joseph is up here, and David's up here, and Esther is up here, and I'm all the way down here, right? But when we study the scripture, you realize, no, the Bible makes clear that the best of men are just men at best, and the only reason they became these champions in the faith is because they cooperated with what God was doing. They were teachable. Do you realize that's all it's about? All it's about is understanding your God, understanding the heart of your father, understanding his ways, and being teachable. That's it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, he said, we had this near-death experience. He says, but the reason God allowed us to have this near-death experience is so that we would stop trusting in ourselves and learn to trust in God. Basically, he's saying, God put me in a situation that was in over my head, so it would be impossible for me to trust in myself. How many of you, does that resonate with you right now? Maybe some of you right now have, are either going through that or just come out of that where you were in something over your head. But see, if we lose track of who God is, if we lose track of God's ways, instead of you even asking God, hey, what are you doing in my life right now? You'll just go into straight panic mode and it's like, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. The Bible says, call upon me in the day of trouble, I'll deliver you. Lord, deliver me, deliver me. People say, hey, how's your life? Just pray for my deliverance, just pray for my deliverance. You just want out, right? Without even stopping to say, Lord, what are you doing? And where are my trust issues arising? That's what happens with impurities, right? When you put precious metals in, in, in the flame. And how are you teaching me to trust you? And how are you actually leading me in a place where I have no choice to tr- but to trust you? You know, God will even lead you in a place where you have two options. Start trusting him or you'll lose your mind. But Paul makes clear in 2 Corinthians 1.9, he says, the reason God did this is so I would stop trusting in myself. You know what? Let me me give you all some points to write down. I'm getting excited. Point one, God is sovereign and he loves you with an everlasting love. Boom. That's it. Someone's like, oh, I wanted something deeper. Yeah, that's plenty deep. Because the Bible tells me that even in heaven, we're still going to be learning in the ages to come about his love. So one, God is sovereign and loves you with an everlasting love. When we say he's sovereign, it means that he runs the show. Jesus would say that a bird can't even fall to the ground without the father allowing it to happen. Nahum chapter one, verse Four and verse seven says God even has his way in the tornado. What does that mean? He has his way in the tornado. Does it mean that God sends tornadoes into, is that what it's saying? No, what it's saying is this. The tornado is basically the epitome of all bets off. No rules seemingly in a tornado, right? Pieces of roof become projectiles. You've seen movies, cows flying across fields. I mean, anything can happen. What it's saying is this. When it says God has his way in the whirlwind, it means even in what seems like the epitome of no rules, all bets off, God is still directing traffic, even in a tornado. That's what it means. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. We have to understand and celebrate his sovereignty because at that point we realize that everything in our life is father filtered. If a bird can't even fall to the ground without the father's permission, nothing can come into your life unless the father permits it. Now that does not make him the author of evil because the Bible says he tempts no man and he is not the author of evil, but he will permit things in our life, but only for the, our good, right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that all things are good. It says in the Bible that he takes everything and makes it work for good. You will not find a verse in the Bible saying cancer is good, that sickness is good, right? That uh, robbery and crime is good. It says that he takes these things and makes them work for good. He takes lemons and turns them into lemonade, right? 
So one, God is sovereign and he loves you with an everlasting love. It is a sovereign love. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, it says this, who could separate me from the love of Christ? Then it goes down the list of every type of drama you can imagine. It says nakedness, nope, peril, sword, shootout, paraphrase, right? Things that go bump in the night, evil, the demonic realm, things to come, things in the past. It means my past can't get in the way of God's love for me. Whatever's coming down the pike, whatever the news says might have, nothing can separate me from God's love. That is what you call a sovereign love, an omnipotent love. So one, God is sovereign and loves you with an everlasting love. Two, are you ready? Our trust in God dictates our joy in God. Our trust in God dictates our joy in God. Let me give you the verse. 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1.8. Paul says, or rather Peter says this, though you have not seen him, who has seen God with the, with the, with the, with the naked eye? Right? Our God is, is the invisible Lord. God is spirit, right? There comes a point when we get to glory, we will see our Lord indeed, right? But now we see him through the lenses of faith. We see him everywhere. Matter of fact, I can't stop seeing him, right? We even see him in one another as we see God's spirit in one another. We see God's hand everywhere, but God is invisible. But it says this in 1 Peter 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not even see him now, you believe and trust in him and you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible and glorious joy. Do you see that? The more you believe that all of this is true, that he is in every moment of your life, every nanosecond of your life, every detail of your life, his hand is at work. He will never leave you or forsake you. The more you believe that, the more you rejoice with joy unspeakable. Do you see that's what the verse just said? Again, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not even see him now, you believe and trust in him and you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible joy. Doesn't it, 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 it registers when we hear that. You're like, it is so true. When my faith is the strongest in who my Lord is, when my faith is the strongest of just all of his promises, don't you notice that what comes right along with that? Joy. When I am weak and my muscles, my faith muscle, right, it has some, has some uh, what do you call it, has some atrophy in it, well, what do I notice? My joy also goes down too, right? So one, God is sovereign and loves you with an everlasting love. His mercies are new every morning. He picked you, you did not pick him. He has a perfect plan for our life. Two, our trust in God dictates our joy in God. Three, if one and two are true, you with me? The most loving thing God can do is teach you to trust him. The most loving thing. Let me read it again. If point one is God is sovereign and loves you with an everlasting love. If point two is our trust in God dictates our joy in God. We will only rejoice in God as much as we are trusting in him, right? Then it only makes sense, point three, the most loving thing God can do is teach you to trust him. That's why the psalmist would say in Psalm 144 verse one, Lord, you teach my fingers how to fight. Lord, who, who teaches? Did it say I teach myself how to fight? No, Lord, you teach me how to fight. And what war refers to in the scripture is the battle of belief, right? Fighting the good fight of faith. Lord, you teach my fingers how to fight. And then point four, this trust in God, this trust in God, it's more than just a trust for our little world. It's also trusting with the burden that he's given you for ministry. Because we can also make the trap, fall in the trap of, 
Well, you know what? Yeah, my lack of trust is why I have insomnia. My lack of trust is why I'm not rejoicing. Wow, this message is going to be great because I'm going to sleep better tonight. <laughs> my insomnia is going to go away. And my little world is, is, is going to, you know, be, be comfy and cozy. And our Lord, he's a good father. If us parents being sinners, if we want our kids to just be in safety, right, how much more so him? But it's not just about having a trust so your little comfort zone is maximized in comfort. It's also trusting the burden he has for you and obeying that ministry burden. And that may be another point, another message after this one. But, you know, something else for you to think about as we're talking about this is what is your burden because we're going to be reading about people who are going to be, we're going to see how they're in the school of faith. We're going to watch how God teaches them to trust him more and more. But we're also going to see that what all of them have in common is they also had a burden. God gave them, God gave them a burden and they trusted that God would work this burden out in their life. Do you have a burden? Do you have a burden? Paul had a burden. Paul said in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, if I could paraphrase, hey, no matter what you see me doing, no matter how much you see me laughing, I have this burden that won't go away. I've got this burden to see Israel, the Israelites, my Jewish people saved. And I want them saved so bad, I'll be willing to go to hell just so they can go to heaven. I'll be accursed just so they could be saved. That's what he's saying in Romans 9, 1 through 3, a burden. We're now going to look at Elijah, a burden. So let's remember at the end of the message, let's not leave out point four, that yes, our vineyard, the trust should make the vineyard. You know, you hear the birds again in the vineyard. You know what I mean? The rejoicing, you know, the flowers. You stop and smell the flowers. You enjoy the process. You live in the now. And you could say, even though this is a little uncomfortable, amen, because God is here with me. But remember, to learn about trusting God more and the, understand the process more, it's not just about your vineyard. It's also ultimately about the burden God's given you and you walking that burden out and trusting that he will keep you and that he will guide you with that ministry burden. So I, I do want you to be thinking about what is your burden because everyone we're going to read about has a burden, all right? Before we even jump into Elijah, I just want to look at some other examples. I mean, goodness, we could do seven parts on this if we wanted to. I'm going to try to bring this all in today, but those are famous last words. When I say trust, what do you battle right now with trusting God with? When I say trust, what do you right now battle with trusting God with? Paul battled some demons that he did not tell us what they were in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said that the enemy would buffet him and would give him this, this thorn in the flesh. The Greek word is a tent stake. There was some way that the enemy was attacking Paul that he said it was the equivalent of having a stake like you put in the ground to hold up a, a rope for a tent. It felt like a tent stake in his side. It must have been so intense, whatever this battle was, because Paul asked the Lord three times to take it away. Now, if you remember three, how many times you prayed for something, you guys know when you went through some of your darkest valleys, you remember those, that one night or that one walk in the park. Paul remembered it. That's how you know that he was praying intensely for this to go away, right? But what did God say to him? My grace is sufficient. I'm, gonna sustain, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to sustain you with it. And Paul said he knew that it was given to him so Paul would not become conceited and arrogant because he was being used so mightily by God. He then said, therefore, 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 and 10, Therefore I rejoice in my weaknesses, because I understand now, when I'm at my weakest and my most humble place, that gives God the room to work the most in my life, right? Paul had to learn to trust God with that burden and that demonic battle. Yes? Moses, when he was called into ministry, what's the first thing he told God? I have a stutter. Let my brother Aaron do the ministry. I'll be his support. He had to learn to trust God with his speech impediment, with his handicap, as Moses felt that that would be enough that he, he couldn't possibly be used to be a leader of God's people with what he felt was a handicap. He had to learn to trust God with that. I mean, we could just keep unpacking it. Peter, Peter had to trust God. Imagine after denying the Lord the mo in the most blasphemous evil way, saying three times, I don't even know him, then outright denying even knowing him or having any association with Jesus. And Jesus is right in earshot as he's doing that, especially the third time. And those of you that went to Israel, we stood right where that happened. How did Peter feel? It says he ran out into the night and wept bitterly. But then we see Peter stand back up in the book of Acts and preach. And when he's preaching, he's telling the Jews, you denied the sovereign Lord Jesus. Wait, he had just denied him. How much trust did he have to have? Trust that God forgives and forgets. Otherwise, he would never say the D word. The deny word, he'd preach on any topic. Hey, Peter, why don't you come teach on uh, uh, the book of Revelation? Why don't you come uh, uh, teach on God's love? Oh, oh, no problem. Hey, why don't you teach on denying? Why don't you rebuke people for denying Jesus? No, can't do that one. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm disqualified from that. How much does he, did he have to trust and in, in, in the Lord's forgiveness that he forgives and forgets for him to be able to stand as a clean slate? Do you know that history says, there's no way to prove it, but history says that while Peter would preach sometimes, his first sermon, thousands got saved. His second sermon, thousands got saved. Some said, tradition says, that while Peter would preach, a mocker would be in the crowd and do this. Yo, can you imagine? Trust. He had to learn to trust. So look, we're looking at someone having to trust with the demonic battles they're having daily. We're looking at someone having to trust with what they felt was a handicap. We're looking at someone having to trust after just gargantuan, diabolical failure and go back into ministry. Trust. Timothy, he was a scaredy cat, right? What did Paul have to write to him? God has not given you that spirit of fear. He's given you a, a spirit of power, love, and a self-controlled mind. He said, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in our Lord. He had to trust with his fear. David, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Job, everyone you study, you could see what God was doing, and they all had to be taught to trust him on deeper levels. Every one of them was in school. You'll see David even say in 1 Samuel 17, verse 34 through 36, he was ready to face Goliath. He said, because, hey, I know I could take this man. He said, because I fought little Goliaths and beat them. What he basically said is, a lion came out, and God protected me, and I killed a lion once. A bear came out, and God equipped me, and I defeated the bear. That's how my trust in God's being with me has grown. Now I'm ready to face that Goliath, and that uncircumcised Philistine is, is dead for defying the name of my God. Do you see that? He was taught. Everyone in the Bible was taught. No one was grabbed, right, and just thrown right at the top for the biggest battle where they did it. Everyone was taught. How has God been teaching you? And what little steps has he been leading you through to lead the bigger steps? 
Do you realize, and I guess the better question is, are you ready to be excited all over again about being in God's school? Being in the school of love where he is teaching you to trust in him because the deeper your trust, the deeper your joy and your rejoicing, the more you enjoy the Lord that loves you so much that he says what in the prophets? As a belt was made to wrap around the waist, I made you to wrap around me. And what is that economy? Trust, faith. I know that when I tell my Lord I love him, I know that when I draw near to him, he draws near to me. Why? Because he said so, but he is developing our trust to believe that. So let's do this. Let's go to 1 Kings 18. Time flies when you're having fun. I want to take a look at Elijah. Elijah is a very interesting prophet. For one, we don't know who his mama is, We don't know who his dad is. We don't know anything about him. He just shows up on the scene as this outdoorsy, rugged guy. He stands in front of the wicked king of Israel and basically says, there's going to be no rain until I say there's going to be rain again. I've just come from the presence of the Lord. I am currently in the presence of the Lord. And I'm telling you, wicked king, there will be no rain until God gets his reverence and all of the demonic worship is put out of Israel. That's basically what he's saying. In 1 Kings 17, verse 1, let's look. It just says, and Elijah the Tishbite. Do you know that's all it says? It's not like a Moses story where we get to see how he was in the ark and he was taken out of the Nile River and how he grew up or like a David that he was out in the field with the sheep. We get no details about Elijah, nothing. This is just like a comet out of right field. It just says, Elijah the Tishbite. That's all you're told. Not the son of, not the grandson of, nothing. Doesn't even mention his tribe right here. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, He goes to King Ahab and says, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there will not be dew or rain for these years except according to my word. If we just look at that, then it's like, wow, there's another giant of the faith, right? Stepping in and just doing his thing. And wow, what a distance there is between him and me as I'm just battling my fears and my trust issues. But when you look at what God has to do before he's ready, would you do this? And just put yourself in this as we read this, okay? Put yourself here, Elijah the Tishbite. And what is clear, no mother, no father, right? No title, Nothing, right? No special pedigree. Doesn't mention his degree. Doesn't mention where he works. It doesn't say anything about him because none of that matters, right? All that matters is being a child of God and you being the apple of his eye. He appears and he basically comes on the scene in front of the king. And this will get you killed because this king Ahab was married to who? Jezebel the most wicked Lebanese demon-worshipping woman far and wide, and Jezebel got this Israelite king Ahab to now set up all of Baal worship. It basically was witchcraft, it was nature worship, it was fire worship, and Baal was believed to bring rain and cause fertility. So what does he do? He basically walks up and says, guess what? All of you guys are worshiping Baal. You're all worshiping the demonic. Baal is the God of rain and fertility. God, you guys are saying basically God is dead. I'm here to tell you, I stand before God. What he's saying, first thing he's basically saying is God's alive. It's basically what he walked in and said. Because picture in northern Israel at this time, they had built their own temple. They had built their own bogus worship. They were worshiping the bull, which was the symbol of Baal. Those of you that just went to Israel with us in September, you stood there and saw the ruins of that. They were basically saying, we're doing all this. Hey, there's no lightning coming down from heaven. God must be dead. And we're going to worship Baal and we're going to worship nature. And rain and fertility was like the main, rain and fertility and fire were the two strongest, what they believed is the way Baal flexed. When their God flexed, rain happened, 
and fertility and fire happen. So what does Elijah do? He shows up and says, guess what? God's alive and no rain. Now, go to 1 Kings 18. In 1 Kings 18, what does he do? He calls all of the false prophets to the top of Mount Carmel, right? After some years, calls all of the false prophets to Mount Carmel, and basically he says to them, let's build two altars, right? Verse 23, let them give us two bulls, let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire underneath it. I will dress the other bull and I will lay it on wood and I will put no fire underneath it. You call on the name of your gods. I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Well, you know the story. The false prophets of Baal begin chanting and it says for hours, they go all the way until three o'clock from morning to three o'clock for over six hours. They are even cutting themselves, bloodletting. First Kings 18 gives you all the details. They're calling on their God. Baal was supposed to be the God of fire. Look at how Elijah shows up and he's going right after what they claim their false God delivered. Oh, he's the God that brings rain? There is going to be no rain. So a famine came in the land, right? He says, oh, you're the God of fire? All right, whichever one answers by fire. He even says, you pick whichever bull you want. You go first. I mean, look at the way this man is trusting in God. But here goes the thing. If we go from 1 Kings 17, where he just shows up on the scene and says, God is alive, and there'll be no rain except according to my word. And if we go right to 1 Kings 18, where we see this man stand mightily as 850 false prophets, demon worshipers are calling on fire, then what does Elijah do when it's his turn? He says, dump water on my sacrifice. He is that confident that God will answer by fire, calls out and fire comes down. Now you have to write this. If you don't write this, then you're missing the story. James chapter 5. James chapter 5 tells us this. It says, Elijah was a man of like passions as us. Do you know, that's when I first got saved and began studying the Bible, that was one of my favorite verses. Because what it means is he's a man of like passions. He's a man that has the same struggles as us. So guess what the Bible wants you to know? You ever wake up on the wrong side of the bed? You ever get grumpy and have to just kind of tell people like in hindsight, man, I was a little grumpy earlier. You ever get short with people? You ever have days where your faith feels real strong? Other days, your faith feels whack. You ever have days where, man, you love the Bible and you just want to kiss it? Other days where you don't even know where it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Guess what? It tells us in James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man of like passions as us, but he prayed fervently. You could basically put in, but he trusted what God said. But he learned to trust God. So now, can we look at how God developed this man? Because again, we see this man show up and say, I'm Elijah the Tishbite. That's all you need to know. God's alive and there'll be no rain until I say so. And remember, Deuteronomy chapter 11, God had told the Israelites back in Moses' day, if you go and worship other gods, I will punish you by withholding rain. So for this to happen was not just out of thin air, if you will, right? But he's trusting in God's word. He's just delivering God's word. So again, 1 Kings 17, we see him show up. 1 Kings 18, we see him standing alone. How many of you guys, like, you know, you down to just have a showdown? Like, you know, two witches, maybe five Satanists. You know what I mean? Five Satanists, like, hey, hey we're here. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, we, you know, we do what we do. And mind you, I have shared Jesus with many Satanists. Uh, I have shared Jesus with Satanists that have done spells, that have some, some gnarly stuff. And we have had some convos, and we've had some, some, some rather intense convos. Uh, but guess what? They're no different than me, and Jesus died for them just like for me. And I used to play with black magic myself. So I'm like, hey, you know what I mean? If you could do it for me, you could do it for you. But say five of them, one on five, you know, oh, one person having a convo with five. Yo, Elijah's going against 850, and he's standing alone. And he calls down fire. 
where do you need to trust God? We have to keep pulling it back to your life, lest we just get lost in this amazing history lesson. Where do you need to trust God? Right? You found God's word. Make 1 Kings 17 the equivalent of the verse you found, right, that, of God that he's going to work it out. Okay? Right? You, you found out that you're sick, right? And you found that verse, God is your healer. He has the perfect plan for your life, right? 1 Kings 17 is when he shows up and just declares God's word. Deuteronomy 11 says no rain, no rain, right? But you know, you quickly learn it's one thing to stand on the verse, right? At, at, and quote it. It's one thing to quote it. It's another thing to keep standing on that and believing God for that, right? So 1 Kings 17, are you following the parallel? He shows up and declares God's word. 1 Kings 18, he stands and he is doing the showdown of all showdowns. So here we go again. What area is God developing your trust in? What area uh, is an area where you need God and you need major breakthrough? And you have to trust him because you can't do it. There's something you have. You cannot do it child rearing, job, family situations, whatever it is, your neighborhood, your city, your safety as you feel, whatever it is. But, but you, have a, you have the promise though. That's 1 Kings 17, 1. That's Elisha showing up and just declaring, no rain. You want to see, how many want to see that fire come down from heaven in that area of your life? That area where you are just you need to trust them and you are waiting and you're waiting. Lord, I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. I need some breakthrough. And you just cannot wait for that fire to come down in that area. And man, if that fire comes down in that area, will you be rejoicing? If that fire of that deliverance, right? That, that whatever it is where you need them. Come on, y'all. Y'all better be thinking. I, I, I'm, I'm doing my thinking. You better, I can't think for you though. You better be doing your thinking. What is that area? What the Bible is bringing, remember, we're looking at the ways of God, the process of God. In between 1 Kings 17, 1, where he just declares it's not going to rain, and then the showdown where he calls down fire from heaven, whew, he went to school. He went to school. These aren't small little details here. This is school. How many of you realize, yes, you know what, Pastor? I am guilty. I just read the biggest parts of the stories and all the details in the middle. I just kind of read fast over them. And I'm realizing today, I pay for that when I exalt just the acts of God and don't make sure I'm looking at what's the ways of God in this whole story. The Israelites in the wilderness, they knew the acts of God. Maybe you say, oh yeah, I know the acts of God. Elijah showed up and I know the acts of God. Elijah called down fire. But what's the ways of God? Because by studying that, you'll know what he's doing in your life. So here it is, Elijah. And remember, what does the Bible say? He's a man that had the same struggles as us. Guess what? It means that he had to be taught just like us. As soon as he says that to the wicked king, it says, the word of the Lord came to him and said, go and get thee hence. Run eastward and go hide yourself by the brook called Cherith that is before Jordan. And it will be that you will drink from that brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Basically, he's telling him, go into the wilderness now. It's not going to rain. A famine is coming. You're going to learn to trust me. Oh, yeah. See, Elijah doesn't know what's to come. Elijah doesn't know that he's about to call 850 demon-worshipping false prophets to a showdown on the top of a mountain. He doesn't know. You don't know what God's preparing you for. God knows. God knows where he's going to be taking Elijah, and God knows the preparation that he needs. Do you know that God says he has a plan for each of our lives? He's already picked out your ministry, and he is preparing you everything. He wastes nothing. Even when Jesus fed the 5,000, what did Jesus say? Oh, it's biodegradable. Leave it for the birds. No, collect all the leftover food, and they had 12 baskets full. He wastes nothing. Everything in our lives is Father filtered. Everything is being used to prepare us for what he knows is ahead for us. That's why it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But we have to learn how to trust him with all of our heart because the ones he's telling to trust him with all of our heart are the ones that have major trust issues. But he teaches us, and these are his ways. Elijah, he didn't start him off by saying, okay, Elijah, you know what? Okay, Elijah, good job, Elijah. 
You just went and said it's not going to rain? 850 false prophets and you're about to have a fire showdown? Lesson number one, young grasshopper, play with fire. And then the Bible says, oh, and Elijah was juggling fireballs in the desert. No, 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 no. He starts them off. That's what David said in Psalm 18. Know what he said in Psalm 18, y'all? One of my favorite verses. I got a lot of favorite verses. David said, Lord, your gentleness has made me great. It's gentle, y'all. Because you would think that, oh, yeah, hey, it's got to be a crash course. He's about to call down fire. He got at least, oh, he about to go up against 850 demon worshipers. He at least got to start out with one demon worshiper. Elijah, go into the wilderness. It's going to be you and a demon worshiper. Can't promise you he's going to be, when you sleep, he might not be sleeping. But, but go on, got to start somewhere. He doesn't start him there. You understand? He starts him with, just go to that brook. You're just going to trust that while there's no rain, I'm going to have you in the middle of the desert. I'm gonna just, you're going to learn to trust me for just water. We're going to start, just trust me for water. Just trust me for water. Oh, and by the way, just so you don't put me in little boxes like we all tend to do, I'm going to also teach you, Elijah, that, that I'm outside of the little boxes you put me in. So instead of um, food just appearing on a rock, I'm going to have ravens bring you food twice a day. Now, how God had the ravens do it, if the ravens were just bringing food and setting up a nest area, but he knew that was for him. By the way, a raven is a, it's not a crow. A raven is a very big bird. It's also a ceremonially unclean bird. And he has him trusting that he's going to get his lunch every day from an unclean bird. See what he's doing also? Part of what God's got to do is he's got to break up them religious boxes that you put together. You see, Elijah, no doubt, in his zeal for God, sometimes we get religious. We get churchy. You know what God will do? He'll actually go after some of that churchiness because it's all about what the Bible teaches. But what we add is we add a lot of churchy culture, right? And we start creating what we think looks tidy and nice. So what does he do? Make sure that you're not getting, he wants to go after that churchiness too. Do you know being churchy will get in the way of you growing and trusting God? What does being churchy mean? It might just mean saying all the right things and not believing it. Yeah, when praises go up, blessings come down. God is good all the time, all the time. Right, you know, and praise God if you mean it when you say it, but we could just say the stuff and say the stuff, you become churchy and you really aren't trusting God at all. Right? So, what's he got to do? He has to break those boxes. What's he do that with Elijah? Ravens bringing you food? I mean, it'd be one thing if it was like doves. I mean, a dove brought back the olive branch to Noah on the ark. It'd be so beautiful if doves brought it and rainbows. And here come a rainbow, here come the doves. No. Foul ravens, ravenous, just, just creatures, that, crazy creatures, bringing him the food. He's learning to trust him. And by the way, he takes him, the place is called Cherith. What Cherith means is it means separation. See, when God wants to teach you to trust him, what he has to do is he takes you to a place where he does what's called separation. He has to separate from you all the things that are getting in the way of you trusting God. He's got to separate fear from you. He's got to separate your trust issues from you, where you finally say to the Lord, you know, Lord, I didn't realize I have such major trust issues. I need, I need some real healing here. He's going to bring this to your attention. Your, that independent streak. What about the way when you are in a trial, you just go in autopilot. You don't mean to leave God out the equation. You just, as a young kid, you've learned the survival thing of just autopilot. That gets in the way of trusting God. He'll put you in a place. Cherith means separation. While he is there drinking from a brook, while everything around him dries up, he could stand there all day and say, well, I wonder when it's going to dry. I wonder when it's going to go down. Let me measure it. It looks like it's an inch lower today. Oh my gosh. It looks like it's two inches lower. Well, at two inches a day, in two weeks, I won't have water. He has to work through all of that alone. And God does this with us alone. And he just has to learn to trust one day at a time. Y'all say one day at a time. And not because I say so. Didn't Jesus even say sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof? One day has enough worries. You don't worry about tomorrow, right? He has to learn just to drink water. And then what? Ravens bringing him food. He is being prepared for the Mount Carmel showdown to call down fire. But look how he's learning. He's learning just for basics, just water and bread. Look at this. 
Even Jesus would say this in Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus said, consider the ravens. They don't sow, they don't reap. They don't grow gardens, they don't grow produce. It says, they don't have a storehouse or a barn. They don't even have a bank account and no 401k, yet God feeds them. How much better are you than the birds? So look at that Jesus would even use the raven as the example, and that's what he's doing with him. Well, it says this, verse 5, he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt by the brook that's before Jordan. Verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Oh, but here it goes. You can get, when God has you at this level, let's call it freshman class, your first day of school in a high school, you could be nervous, right? How many of y'all remember your first day of high school? Were you nervous? Yeah, you walked into a whole new school. You're the little fish in a big pond. You could be nervous. But how were you by the end of freshman year? Oh, you're acting like you're a senior, dribbling balls up and down the hallway. You know, teachers like, oh, slow your roll. You know, you're not, a, you know, hanging out with the seniors. Oh, you're not a senior, right? So what could begin as a trial for some people, after a while, guess what? You get, it, at first it was scary for you, but now you, you done mastered that. You get, you get a little comfortable. So what's he got to do? He's got to take you to another level now, right? So what happens? The brook dries up. Because remember, the first couple days he's watching, now he's trusting, he's trusting. He, now he's walking to the brook singing a song. Oh yeah, my God, drink ye from the waters of salvation, splashing it on his face. My God's an awesome God. I love you, Jesus. You know what I mean? And it's all right, okay, he's passed that test. It's time for the next level of learning to trust God. So what happens now? Boom, the brook dries up. Can you imagine now? He's walking and he realizes, whoa, I went from trust issues to trusting, to cocky. And yo, now God's got to make sure that he, what would we say? The most loving thing God can do is teach you to trust him more and more. So imagine when he goes to the brook the one morning and he's got his same song. Oh yeah, well's the salvation, let's go. And it's dry, whoa. Now he's got to look, well, some churchiness done crept in, <laughs> some comfort done crept in, maybe even a little ingratitude. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I thought I was trusting him. I, I've become comfortable, and I haven't even been working on my trust in wow, new level now. The brook dries up. He, God's got to get his attention again. Don't y'all notice that in your life? Right? You go through a valley, and you learn that, wow, God, you're really here in the valley. But then you get comfortable. Get comfortable. You don't need to pray no more. You don't need to meditate on scripture no more. You're like, God got this. God got this. And then that cockiness can actually cause you to get distant from God. So what's he got to do? The most loving thing he could do? Get your attention again. How many of y'all right here, right now, are going through a season where God just had to get your attention again? Come on, talk, talk to me. Because we're talking about a living God. We ain't playing church here. You're going through something where you're like, yo, that makes sense. Yeah, a year ago it was a trial. A year ago he had my attention. But yo, I got real comfortable here and I didn't realize it until he got my attention. My prayers ain't really prayers no more. My, my, my crying out for help is kind of like, a, well, help me if you want, but I kind of got this too. I got a plan B if not. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, he had to get the brook dried up. Now, unfortunately, because so many people don't meditate on the ways of God, this is when people stop coming to church. <laughs> Where are you at? I don't know. I'm just figuring stuff out right now. No, no. You don't have to figure nothing out right now. It's right here in the Bible. You just got to be in a church that's teaching you that Bible, right? So now God wants to take him to the next level. So what does he do? The brook dried up. There was no rain. So the Lord comes to him in verse 8 and says, now I want you to go, verse 9, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, meaning it's in Lebanon. Dwell there now, mind you, the famine is bad now. It's not rained in some time, right? It, look, there's no wawa. If there's a famine, there's no crops. And if there's no crops, you're not eating. So what does he say? Oh, the brook dried up here. I want you to go to Zarephath now. You know what Zarephath also means? Zarephath means melting and separation. It's a word that blacksmiths use when they're forming metal and taking impurities out of metal. Is it a coincidence that the places where God is developing Elijah's faith are all named with separating stuff out of your heart? Taking separation, fear, 
getting all that stuff out of your heart so you could trust God more. Now he's in Zarephath. And what does he say? Mind you, the first trial was go to this brook. You're going to drink from this water during the famine. Everyone else will have no water, but you're going to trust me for water. Statistics are going to say it's bad, but you're going to trust me for water. People around you will have a spirit of fear, but you're going to be alone and you're going to trust me for water and food. Then the brook dries up. Ready for the next one? Maybe Elijah would have loved it if he just went to another brook with some more ravens. <laughs> Isn't that right? Our flesh doesn't want to be stretched that way. We would love it if it would be like, okay, now you're going to go to brook part two and ravens part two. Matter of fact, oh my gosh, it's the same ravens. <laughs> I love this. I mean, if we could write out our own script, one, it would be, we would make it very cushiony, but guess what? We wouldn't grow. We would stay immature. We would, we would stay stuck. That's why you become a believer where you're the same believer you were last year. You don't look any more like Jesus, don't have any more mind-blowing stories of just how he's shown his love for you. Your faith is weak, and you're basically just doing what everyone else does. So what does he do? He's got to up it. He says, now you're going to go to Zarephath, and a multimillionaire is there. Oh, he's loaded, and, and you're just going to eat at his table. No, that's not what he says. Nah, you're going to go to Zarephath, and there's a widow there with a child. A broke widow with a son to worry about. She's going to be taking care of you. Now you graduated from trusting the ravens. Now you're going to have to trust that a widow in a broke neighborhood and a broke house that she's going to actually take care of you. So what happens? He goes and sees the woman gathering sticks. She says to him from the gate. It ain't like she says, hey, yo, Elijah, guess what? I got mad money. I got a sack of money in the back of the house. I got food connects. They think I'm a poor widow. I'm really that girl. Like, come on, like rock, rock with me. Yo, Elijah, oh, no, no, no. What'd she say to him? Yo, just picture this, what he gets when he gets there. I'm gonna just make a fire because I only got enough food for me and my son to eat one more meal and we're dead. That's his welcome. Oh, welcome, Elijah. Yeah, um, oh, what am I up to? No, I'm just making a meal to die. I'll probably die tomorrow, but come on. Yeah. Yo, what is God doing in your life to teach you to trust him? You control everything. You're so good at everything. If you just give me a minute to just think, you always work it out. And what did God do? Put you in some things you cannot work out. And you're going to have to say like Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. This is how you know when God's at work, when he brings you to the place where you say, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. It's the most loving thing God can do. Because doesn't your Bible tell you, tell me, tell us that in his presence is fullness of joy? Well, that then means that out of his presence is depression and fear and sadness. But see, I only understand and am in his presence when I'm believing what his word says and when I'm looking to him. If I'm not, and this is where the rest of the world is, going from thrill to thrill, party to party, high to high, crazy thing to crazy thing, money-making scheme to money-making scheme, hustle to hustle, promotion to promotion, you know, travel place to travel place, and it adds up to, what does Solomon say? When you hit the equal sign, nothing, chasing wind. So the most loving thing he can do is do whatever it takes to keep you looking to him. So now, we're going to end now. We, we could keep going. She said it. But let's do this. We'll talk about this some more next week. What is God doing in your life? Where, where are you to where you have to trust him? And, and, and first, let's also rehearse back. What, what, is, what deliverances has he, has he done? What situations have you, your family, your job? It says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord and don't forget his benefits. The thing is, we do forget. We don't celebrate what he's done. What has he done? Because David said, the Lord that delivered me from that lion and the Lord that delivered me from that bear, I know he's with me now. David kept short accounts of what God had done. What's God done in your life? To where you could say, oh yeah, the Lord that delivered me in this, he's going to deliver me here. The Lord that never forsook me here, he's going to keep me there. The Lord that kept my mind right then, he's going to keep my mind right today. 
The Lord that sustained me. I, oh, I forgot, Lord. I didn't think I'd ever even smile again. I was so depressed. And look at me now. How quickly I forgot. And here comes another trial, and I'm tempted to... No, my same Lord that did that then, because he doesn't change. This is faith. Now, do you see why when that Roman centurion said to Jesus, Jesus, my, my servant is sick, but, but you don't even have to come see him. Just speak the word from where you are right here. Because I carry the Roman shield on my shield. And because I'm under the authority of Rome, I can just speak the word and people will jump and run and do whatever. You carry the authority of heaven. So therefore, if I can say a word and people jump with a Rome, with Rome on my shield, you can just speak the word. And Jesus says, whoa, I've never seen faith like this in all of my Jewish people. Faith, trust, but letting him teach us to trust him. This is what we'll do. We'll come in next week. How many of y'all, how many of y'all just be, through faith in God, you watched him. You ever see like a dad teaching the son how to swing? Wow, right? Hit the wiffle ball or whatever, you know? How many of you have stories of where, man, God has held your arms and, man, did you hit a grand slam for God? Yeah? yeah? Grand slams feel good, don't they? Yeah. Feel phenomenal. Yeah. Going, 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 right? But then what happens when, and you feel like it's grand slams from here on out. Well, what happens when you go and you're supposed to be the home run king? Matter of fact, you've been doing such great things for God, people start calling you stuff like, oh yeah, you're the home run king. What you got now for God? And you think you'll never fail again, and then you fail in the most embarrassing way, as though you, that wasn't even you that hit the home run. Guess what, y'all? That's what Elijah's going to do. We're watching this man, unless you be tempted to say, oh, wow, Elijah, okay, he started out learning to trust God for water, trusting God to feed him when there's no food, birds brought him food. Now he's with the widow, and even though she only had enough food left for one more meal, it just, there was always food there. Then he goes up on the top of the mountain against 850 demon worshipers, calls down fire. You're like, oh, he's good. (laughs) You know, when you think someone's good, you don't even ask about them no more. You ask about the people you worried about. You'd be like, yo, how's so-and-so? How's so-and-so? But then in your mind, you're like, she good. (laughs) You don't have to tell me about her. I know she's good. He's good. That's what you would think about Elijah, wouldn't you? But guess what? Chapter 19 After Elijah slaughters the false prophets and calls down fire, even has water dumped on the offering, he was so confident that fire would lick up everything. Jezebel hears that he killed the false prophets, and Jezebel basically says, if I could paraphrase, yo, on my mama, you're going to be dead the same way tomorrow. (laughs) Now, you would expect Elijah to say, hey, yo, (laughs) I'm not the one. Like, have you read my last two chapters, Jezebel? (laughs) Go study me. Google me. Google me. Google me. No, what does he do? Yo, he runs into the desert and basically goes to where Moses got the Ten Commandments and says, God, kill me. And what does God do? And we'll look at that next week. Does God come and say, shame on, come on, you pick yourself up. You're going to be, you're going to make the Bible look bad. Get up, you. And how many of you feel like sometimes that's the way God's disappointed in you? Do you remember something? God is all knowing. What it means is he can't learn. You learn about your failures. He, he can't learn. He knows already. Yo, know, what does he do to Elijah? You know what he does? You ready? What did King David say? Your gentleness has made me great. What does he say to Elijah? Get up, you. No one's around. Fix yourself up. Fix your face. You ever have your mom say that to you? Fix your face. (laughs) Fix your face. People don't need to know our business. Fix your face. (laughs) Stand up. (laughs) Put your shirt in. Is that what he does? And God bless, praise God for our mamas, especially single mamas who be holding it down. Mom, salute mom. She watches online. What does God say? No, God does this. Elijah, after all those victories and all graduating from all the schools of faith and trust, 
He now runs and says, God, kill me. He doesn't even, you'd think he'd run back to the brook where the ravens were. Yo, let me just, let me just get my head right. This is where God showed me how to do it. I'm going to just meditate. Oh yeah, the ravens went to the widow's house. Yo, what's up? Hey, how you been? I'm just here to meditate and kind of rehearse what God did. Okay. No, he runs as if he ain't go to no school to the middle of the desert and says, God, kill me. What does God do? God comes and says, you ready? Take a nap. It says in Psalm 103, God knows, he remembers that we're just dust. We fail and we fail well. He says, Elijah, take a nap. And here, have something to eat. (laughs) He just puts him to bed with milk and cookies. What you need, you just need a nap. My son, point one, God is sovereign and loves you with an everlasting love. So we're going to come in and look at that next week. How even after we've, we're mature now, we've learned and grown so much. And then you fail even there. And you fail horribly as though you don't know nothing. And how God even then is still the one developing us, loving us, and growing us. So now do you realize Whether you fail, whether you're right now, maybe one of you right now, you're in Mount Horeb. I don't know, God, just kill me. Rapture me or kill me. And if you kill me, let it be easy. I want to go out easy. Like, you know, yo, whether you're there or whether you're calling down fire right now or whether you're in the widow's house, do you realize there's no better place to be? Because no matter where you are, you know where you are. You're in his love right now. The rest are just details. That's why he says, trust in me with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. So why don't we do this now? Just those things where you need them a lot right now. Would you just tell them, find the promise. Stand on the promise. Lord, I feel this. Would you say this here? And then just trust that he's going to help you believe it more. He's going to develop you to believe it more. Your job is just to take the promise and hold it. He's going to teach you how to hold it tighter. We don't know how. He's going to teach you how to hold on. So let's have the worship team come up. And let's rejoice that we are so loved by God that he is with us. We will talk about burdens next week as well. Um, But, yo, we're loved by God. How many of you, do you feel that he knows right where you are? Do you have a newfound confidence that he knows where you are? What did Job even say? Job said, in a nutshell, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on. But he said, but he knows the way that I should take. And when he's done with me, I'm going to shine like gold. See what Job basically said? I don't know the details. I don't need to know the details. He knows the details. And when he's done with me, I'm going to shine like gold. Amen? So, Lord, thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Lord, we're sorry for doubting you. We're sorry when we doubt your love. We're sorry when we listen to our fears, when we listen to just weird voices and not your voice of truth. Thank you for who you are. Continue to just draw us to seeing you in this way, the biblical way. We repent of seeing you, thinking we see you right, but we realize when we get in the Bible, we've been seeing you a little bit wrong, and we pay for that. Thank you for your love. Lord, we pray you'd receive this offering and tithe. Would you receive it as worship as we give to you sacrificially? May every penny be used to touch lives and share your love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship, and God bless you.